What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again, and this time we are here with Ayal of the Almighty Doth. It is so great to be able to talk to you. Thanks for being here today, man. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to have you here, man. This new album, uh, The Deceivers, is absolutely kick-ass, and it's been 14 years since we've gotten the last Doth album, since the self-titled one. So was this intended to just sort of be the sequel to it or continuing in that vein or was this meant to really be new uncharted territory and a new beginning for doth both both um I, I think that uh if if you're keeping it pure um and honest artistically if you're in the same place 14 years later that that's weird hmm. yeah. it's weird like uh i don't understand it like when i just like on a personal level, when I meet people who are into without, I, it's not not the same as like still loving something from the past, but are like still in the same headspace that they were in 14 years ago. Like, you know, people we went to high school with who were still in that headspace, like that was the best time ever. Like it, they haven't moved on from that. Like that's, that's kind of how I would see uh, if we were to recreate the sound from back then, it would be kind of equivalent to that, but on a musical level, mm -hmm. uh, just like this weird um, standstill or something or uh, lack of evolution. So in order to do an actual sequel that's honest, it has to be evolved. It has to be new uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, both, both. Was there at all sort of like a vision that you had going into the making of this album, or was it a very improvisational and very experimental songwriting process? Also both. Um, so the vision was that it had to be our best, our best album, and it also had to be uh, everything that we loved about the band and that people loved about the band times a thousand, basically. So and everything that. Uh, because you got to keep in mind, we kind of see this as like a miracle that we're able to do it again. But we know that there's no guarantee we'll get to make another one. Uh, just the fact that this is even happening, I'm here talking to you, that I was holding the vinyl, like all of that is just crazy to us. So um, we just decided that we're going to go as all out as possible with this one. Um, it possibly, it being an exclamation point on the end of a sentence, hopefully it's just a, a comma or a exclamation point before another sentence, but you, you never know. And so wanted to go all out with all the types of things that I couldn't do before that I wish that we had done. And they're just also a honest representation of where we're at now. Well, I got to tell you, you most certainly succeeded with that because when you open Thanks. up with no rest, no end and the way that you end into, into forgotten dirt, but even like, Every track in between, from Ascension to Hex, uh, Unending to you know Purified by Vengeance, everything just hits hard. And it's no matter how it hits you, it still hits equally as hard. Which is what I think makes not even just this album, but the whole Death catalog. You you have different angles of hitting people, but it's all equally hard. If you know what I mean. Thanks. I mean, we, since the beginning, we have not believed in filler uh, or of uh, repeating ourselves. So, you know, some people have different opinions on how, on changes we've made to the sound over the years, but that was always by design. Like it was never, never repeat yourself. So some of my favorite bands um, are like Mr. Bungle or something where every record is just totally different from the last one. You still know it's them, but it's just nothing like the other one. And fans don't always like that. And then sometimes they do. Um, I also, I love Opeth a lot. Um, and I know that lots of people don't like that they went classic rock or ditched the death metal, but I think it's great. Even though I do prefer the older, the middle era death metal stuff, uh, I still love the change that they made because it's honest and I really, really appreciate uh, bands that are, aren't afraid to just go in a different direction. Now. I still love bands like Cannibal Corpse and Slayer who have their thing and keep it going. But for me, it's always been every album by Doth has to have a very unique identity to it, to where even if you know it's us, like maybe there's some like harmonic or like melodic kind of 
thing we do or like some of the trippier sounds like you can recognize as us or like people have said that I have a riff style that's recognizable. All that stuff aside, you should still be able to identify each record as that record from the production to songwriting to the playing to the types of things on there. Yeah, I, um, I agree. 100%. So like um, even Slayer, who people consider to be uh, like uh, very consistent, I don't think Slayer's cons- that much of a, and I don't mean it in like a negative way, but like, for instance, Divine Intervention, uh, and all the guys in Slayer even agree with this, but that album was mixed with a baked potato. Like, so it's gonna sound quality wise, not the best in a way. Diabolus and Musica, I actually think is a really good record, but I could easily say after that album that Tom Araya is my favorite rapper. And um, then you compare God Hates Us All, and then you look at an album like World Painted Blood, it's very like anthemic, if you will. So I even think that no matter, even if a band tries to be consistent, I don't think you can. Even Not Cannibal if you're Corp- being honest. Yeah, even Cannibal Corpse has some clean guitars on Gallery of Suicide, so. Well, the, the thing is, those bands, they're still not copying their old stuff. They just, I think they stay closer to their core. So like, whereas they'll expand like 10% from their core, their every album, um, you know, like I feel like those bands definitely have evolved a lot over the years. Uh, they just, they don't take crazy left turns where they change their sound completely. Like they, you, they still have lots of the same types of riffs. Um, but one thing I have always appreciated about Slayer is every record they do bring in something new. Absolutely. Um, they've always done that. And I think that that's part of what kept them fresh is that they all, they always had something new happening. Yeah. Well, Yet, you're damned. It was like ten percent new always. Well, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You could people could criticize you for being repetitive just as much as they could cre- uh, critique yep. you for being directionless. So, I think in the end, I don't care if Death puts out fucking butt rock on the next album. There are going to be people who love it and people who hate it. You know. Yeah, which is why you shouldn't worry about what uh, about what other people think too much. Like you, it's dishonest to say when someone says they don't care at all. Like, I just don't think that's possible. No, it's not. But, but to let it sway you too much, I think, it, like, if you let it sway you too much, it's a fool's errand because, like you said, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You try to please one person too much. First of all, you don't even know if you're going to succeed in pleasing them because you don't actually know what their sensibilities are, what their tastes are. You're guessing. So you may or may not please them, and then you might or might not alienate a whole other group of people by doing that. Like you never, you never know. So it's better to just kind of be true to yourself. And yeah, if I the best. if I was worrying about pleasing everybody in the interview world, already half of this interview would be cropped out by now. Like I, I think <laughs> I think it would just it would start off. We are here with death. Have a good day, everybody. Like and <laughs> that, that's the end of it. But speaking of looking back at the past, though. We do have to look back because this year just marked 20 years since the debut of, of Duff. And Futility, I think, is still aged like fine wine to this day. Still a fantastic album. And I think just like when we get move on from the Hinderers to uh, the Concealers to the self-title to this, it really represents you guys hitting the ground running. Just with your entire life to make your first record, what was the thought process behind the making of Futility? And how has the evolution exceeded since then? So futility, that's been thinking back to that time period. When I was in uh, elementary school. Yeah, it was hazy. Uh, but but like the lots of the same elements that were present then are present now in that like the uh, still into trippy dark sounds, still into no rules on the writing. And uh, what originally the band started as trying to combine electronic music with uh, with death metal. And um, whether we succeeded or failed at that is up to listeners to decide, but that's kind of where it started. Um, it was Divinium but, and Sanus before Divinium and Sanus, and it was actually good. <laughs> you said it. Um, <laughs> but, but like the, but also, you know, I was talking about this with Dave Davidson on the podcast. In at that age, you're very much in an experimental phase of your life, like as a musician, like there's a phase where you're trying to figure out who you are 
and you earlier revocation they did a lot of stuff according to him that he wouldn't do now because he was still finding himself and you can hear that in futility like there was a like there was we were starting to figure out who we were i was starting to figure out who i was as a writer and a musician but there's still there are like paths that would go down experimentally that i wouldn't go down now um but the but the thing that was that's remained consistent is the willingness to go down the paths and see what happens and um let it come out the way it's going to come out uh that's i mean that is still how the deceivers was written like there was no no uh set idea other than like i said it's got to be better um and it's got to be like over the top but when it comes down to like actually making it in the moment it's exactly the same it's just sitting down with a blank you know blank daw screen and a guitar and making stuff and then liking or not liking what you're hearing and when you like something pursuing it when you don't like something ditching it like that's identical so the only thing that's changed is uh where i'm at mentally yeah well uh, yeah i mean the, the, the world itself always changes we always change what you create i think the benefit of an album is that that doesn't change when you put that out that's what we're hearing and yep. you know your 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 attachment to it can change the songs can mean something to you differently but i think in the end like an album is representative of a space and time and it's representative that and i think it's also a good representation of how time is relative for instance i was a late bloomer with doth i wasn't listening to that album i wasn't listening to futility when i was just entering fourth grade but like that's uh, good <laughs> but like so that album doesn't take me back to 2004 it takes me back to around 2015 when i started getting interesting really into death metal like and, and for all your albums pretty much this is the only album that's going to take me back to the year that it came out you know what i mean that's wild to think about, but that makes that makes sense. Like, I mean, music's great in that way. Um, in that, unless you're writing, unless you're trend hopping, uh, it's pretty much timeless. Uh, it's only again only not when you're trend hopping, because you can associate a trend with an era. But um, otherwise, you know, people will discover older music at any time. And I think that that's I think that that's wild, and that's why like thinking about my headspace, uh, it still doesn't. It's I still am not sure how that relates to the listener's headspace, just because 2015 we were already in a hiatus, right? Like we had already made self-titled, and by 2015 I was sure that this was over forever. Um, so it's really it's like wild to me thinking that someone discovered it like the beginning of it when it was already dead there's or, been a lot of bands i've gotten into that are just not around my favorite black metal band life lover that band is never coming back and i discovered them maybe 10 years after their original songwriter passed so like it really i think it i think again music is the best representation that time is relative forget about anything that fucking einstein said it was it's music that proves that well yeah and when if you look at older music the the feeling that is in it uh is just as relevant as now as it was then um and the sophistication in it like if you look at some like orchestral music or just some of the melodic and harmonic content and like stuff like by the beatles or something that stuff is sophisticated super sophisticated no daws um so they're just going off of whatever knowledge they had and wherever their ears took them um and it's just as sophisticated as modern music and it just goes and it hits people the same way which is it just goes to show that um whatever the through line is for music uh is independent of the era it's from i think yeah definitely but when you are working on a something for a long period of time because i feel like your music does really capture a moment and an emotion but if you're working on a song for days or weeks you know maybe you track the guitars but it's a while till you get drums or vocals do you find it the longer you work on something the harder it is to sort of maintain the initial spark of the idea 
Mm. Yeah, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because um, maybe the initial spark. So spark doesn't mean great. Spark just means spark, right? So, and the spark, the sparks can last or they can fuel some a fire that lasts long or short. Um, and so like, it's always different. And sometimes you'll get a spark and you'll get an idea that's not, it's just not there yet, but there is something there. And so you kind of have to keep on getting new sparks uh, in order to complete the idea or to finish the song. But that doesn't make it less valid than if you do it in one go or something. Do you believe that, um, oh fuck, I was losing my train of thought. Uh, do, oh, do you believe that inspiration could be sought out? Can you go out and look for the inspiration or does it just have to strike you in order to maintain the organic nature? Uh, well, the more you look for it, the more it'll strike you. So you can't engineer it, but you can definitely uh, welcome it in. Um, the more often you sit down to do the thing, uh, the more often you'll be in a situation where when it does strike, you're ready to take advantage of it. So that's why all the pro writers I know, like not band guys, but like professional composers, um, do that right for like video games or movies or whatever, right for other artists. Uh, they do it like a day job. Um, like the, I think the McGordon said, uh, inspiration is for amateurs habit is for pros or pros get it done it's oh, just I yeah love that yeah inspirations for amateurs pros get it done um it's not that he doesn't believe in inspiration it's just that he doesn't wait for it you just sit down and you do the thing some days are gonna be better than others so like for on the deceivers like hex unending was pure inspiration like wrote the whole song in one four hour sitting um everything that came after that four hour sitting was just refinement. Uh, Ascension was written over a period of six months. No rest, no end, took like six months. So, and uh, I'm not, you know, one of those will be somebody's favorite song. The other one will be somebody else's favorite song. I don't think that one's more valid than the other, um, but the songs that happen quickly, like Hex Unending, that are pure inspiration, if you wait for those to happen, they're not going to happen that often because that's like you won the lottery. Like, because that day you just happen to be in the perfect mood, the perfect state of mind. Like, your hands felt great. Like, your ears were great. Like, you were in like a way to some sort of level of understanding where you knew what to do with the ideas and no one was distracting you. Like there's all these things that have to happen, uh, that have to come together uh, just like perfectly for that to happen. And you can't wait for that. No. You just have to sit down and do the thing. Well, one of the, a tattoo artist I know told me that if she only tattooed when she was inspired, her bills wouldn't be paid. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I, I do like that idea that inspiration is for amateurs. Uh, pros get it done. That is a like I might tattoo that on myself when I go back to the shop. So this Dude, it's be... it's the truth. Um, and it, like I think that someone who doesn't do this stuff for a living might hear that and be like, "That's that sucks." Like it's isn't it about the art? And it's like, yes, it is about the art. That's exactly what it's about. You're not letting the way you feel in the moment prioritize whether or not you're gonna do the art, like the art is gonna prioritize. Yeah. It's gonna be prioritized. You're gonna do it no matter what. Yeah, well the feelings that, I've always said that when feelings are sometimes the fuel to your fire, you could become, sometimes become victimized by your own product in a way, where you totally. can either you succumb to madness in the process so that therefore the concept of composition and form goes completely out the window or you're so hooked in your own emotions, you just end up pestering and pandering to them and not getting anything done, as you said. Yeah, that, I think that's that's accurate. Like the, also the things that you're expressing, um, I feel like they, they're deeper than a one-time emotion, right? Usually it's uh, like, it's something deeper that should last longer 
then I feel good about this thing right now. Yay. Or I'm sad. I watched a sad movie. I'm sad for 15 minutes. Yeah. Like, it's deeper. It should be deeper than that. And it should be stronger than how you feel for like an hour or yeah. two hours. You know, as an artist, I create things on impulse plenty of times where I don't put thought into it. I just like to go into it. And I just want to exercise. You know, the, 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 the process is what mm -hmm. I do it for. So I just feel the exercise. Cool, I got this painting done. May not be the best quality, but I got something done that day. And then, you know, I, but I'm aware of it. And therefore, like, I know, okay, I'm going to do something with more forethought and plan it. So there is a duality, too. You can go back and forth. I know, you know, take a band like Slipknot, for example. They were always fucking chaotic at what they did. They were puking mm -hmm. in their own masks and beating the shit out of each other on stage. But there is professionalism involved to get the technical proficiency that they do on paper or on CD. Totally. But with what you just said of, uh, you know, sometimes it is like, feeling in the moment sometimes it's planned out fact is you're doing it though like yeah. you're you're do either way you're you're doing it and so yeah i think that the the getting inspired thing when it happens it's like awesome it's a great thing and people should ride that wave when it happens because you're going to get great stuff usually not always but usually but when it doesn't happen you should sit down and do it anyways i think I definitely think that's that's that, kind of the moral of the story because like the inspiration is great it's just unreliable i love that you you're giving me some of the greatest i i ask these questions these are usually questions that i always have like stockpiled for many of the artists i interview and this was some of the best answers i've gotten so for real thank Thanks. you like i think a lot of artists needed to hear this too and i just was curious too because doth i feel like is such a thought-provoking death metal band in a way not to pigeonhole you guys, but like I think with the style that you have, it's brutal, it's in your face, but there's a lot of, I don't know if it's within the vocals or the lyricism or what's in your riffing style, your music make, doesn't make me headbang, it makes me go in my own head and think of different things. Do you approach things from a conceptual standpoint where maybe lyricism or an experience maybe helps guide your hand with regards to the songwriting, or do you need music or need like a structure before you could say this is what the song is about? And this is the conceptual meaning behind it. It's all feel and sound first. Um, the The concept comes later. I mean, so there's like a general, like concept soup, I guess, at the beginning, which is like some very general thoughts on how we're feeling about things. Like, what are we pissed off about? Like, what, what, what's going on? But it's never too deep like it's never too deep like this is going to be about this all right let's go right about that like, it's never ever like that it's it comes from like i think of it as like pre-language and it's not very intellectual i think there's there was a lot of intellectual work that went into developing the ability to make music um you know studying it practicing it studying production like that takes a lot of intellectual work. And then once you have something, once you've gotten through the inspiration phase or the initial phase of sometimes editing it or like chopping it up or figuring out how you can make it better, that can be intellectual. But the the origins of it are very, very vibe, vibe and feel oriented. Um, and, you, and I feel like you gotta trust your instinct. I feel like if you do the work as a musician, like you develop your ear, you develop your skills, uh, you develop your confidence and your trust. You can trust that when you go to write, whatever your uh, whatever your gut is telling you is like that's good, that's bad. This needs a layer here. Like you can get into this rhythm where it's happening really, really fast, and you don't have to question your decisions too much. Um, but you're not like intellectualizing it. You just kind of know because you're. Uh, because you, you know what's right and what's wrong. But it took intellectual work to get to that point, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you of all people, and I've interviewed everybody from the Morbid Angels to the Obituaries, Cannibal Corpses, and I love all these death metal bands. And sometimes I get the answers where we just want to go all in, pedal to the metal, show no mercy, you know, we sing about this and all this. 
totally cool. And I understand that. You know, I interviewed uh, Glenn Benton a couple weeks ago, and he says, like, mm -hmm. we write what we do. We don't put much thought into it. We literally just go into it. And I don't see anything wrong with that. But for you to Me dissect either. the method behind the madness and really just kind of lay it all out on why we do what we do, I think is something really extraordinary to hear. Because I don't think that in the world of death metal, it's often appreciated enough. And no no fault by, by the bands, by the fans, by people in the industry, I don't think it's appreciated enough and no fault of their own. People just want music in the end and appreciate it. For you to dissect it and really look at the skeleton of all this, I think is really unique because it goes to show that this isn't just about playing as loud as possible, playing as fast as possible, being as gory or as satanic or brutal as possible. There is a method behind this madness and something inside of all of us that makes us gravitate towards this and i think really that this is a you you should really narrate a death metal documentary i mean i'd be happy to thank you um i mean the the thing is that even if you're just trying to be brutal or gory you still have to listen to your instinct right like when some even if someone doesn't know music theory or doesn't has never like sat down and tried to figure that out but they're they write sick music they're it, they still figured it out in their own way and they're still sitting there and listening to their gut and knowing this is good this is bad this is what it should sound like this is what feels right uh, whether they're using those words or not you're still making those decisions um and glenn benton's making those decisions too what the way that he might verbalize it or think about it might be different, but at the end of the day, he's still deciding what's good and what's bad and what is right and what's wrong in their songs. And so he has to have some sort of criteria to come up with that. Definitely. Um, so before it, the criteria could be, it's gotta be as satanic as possible. There you go. And I think, sure. or that the hatred or intensity behind it. Yeah. I, I just, I love, I fucking love to decide. But anyway, um, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And most of all, just thank you for coming back and delivering just an absolute brutal beast of an album. Just with The Deceivers coming out, is there just anything else you'd like to promote or anything else we could be expecting from Doth in the near future? Hopefully more albums. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another music video coming for another one of the songs. Uh, hopefully there will be touring, but, you know, really, hopefully what we can all look forward to is, is another album. No, oh, and I cannot wait to hear more because that's what this album did. It definitely left me wanting more. But thank you so much, everybody. We are here with Doth, The Deceivers. Be sure to pick that up. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Thanks, dude. Thank you very much.